Start telling you the story with Chana, right? The story with Chana, of course, is that Chana had no children. It's Tafteh of Rosh Hashanah. It's the beginning of Sefer Shmuel. Chana had no children, and her husband, whose name was Alkana, Alkana was a Adam Godel, had another wife whose name was Penina, and Penina had children. So the pasuk says something in the Gemara. The way the Gemara explains it, it's really it gets really upsetting. Pinina used to tease Chana. Vitsi arato tsaroso gam kas, or something like that. Pinina used to chep as with Chana that I have children and you don't have children. But the Gemara says, Lashem Shamayim Neskavna, that this that Pinina chep as with Chana was, Pinina knew that Chana was a big tzaddikis, and Pinina knew that if Chana would daven, she would have children. And Penina wanted to be more in Chana a Ratzon for Tfila, and therefore she bothered her. That's what the Gemara says. That's what the Gemara says. Penina is my Miskavna. So Chana davened. One of the one of the psukim in the parsha is that Alkana Alkana sees his wife and how upset she is, and he says to her, "Why are you so upset?" You're married to me. It's as good as having ten children. That's what he tells her. And if he tells the term, his time it was Emis, and she, she wasn't buying. She wanted a child. So she went to the base of Mikdash to Davin. She refused to eat. She refused to eat, refused to drink. Remember, they went to the base of Mikdash to do Aliyah Laregel, to eat a carbon, at a time that Aliyah Laregel was neglected. The A lot of people were not going up. It, was, it wasn't the base of Mikdash. It was Mishkan Shiloi. But al Khanna was a Chsid Shahid, he was a Navi. He took his gun to Mishpacha, they went up to the base of Mikdash, and they made a Zevach, and the whole thing. And Chana refused to participate. So she went into the base of Mikdash, and she davened, right? Well, I forgot the Lashayness. I mean, there's all kinds of Lashayness. Right? She cried, and she davened. And I, and I explained to you yesterday that this is only my understanding. This is my uh, surmise. This is what seems to me. That at that time, Chana, the Gemara says that many, many halachas of tefillah we learn from Chana. And I think it's not the pshat that many halachas of tefillah we learn from Chana. It's the pshat that Chana changed many halachas of tefillah. Chana's tefillah becomes the basis of how we daven. The idea that we don't speak out loud. We learn from her. Because until Chana there was a different custom. And the custom until Chana was actually, it was very logical. right? It was like I told you the other day, you mentioned it to me the other day. That when you daven, you try to frame the Ebishter in front of you like a person. And you talk to him, uh, uh, forgive me for using that expression, man to man, or in this case, woman to man, straight. You talk to the Ebishter. But we don't know what he looks like. You don't have to know what he looks like. You create a space in front of you that he's focused, or you're focusing on him. But there's a thousand people in one shul. Right? And each person makes three steps back and three steps forward. Like I always tell you, the beginning of the said the more important thing is the three steps forward. The end of Shemineser, the more important thing is the three steps back. You're approaching the Eibishter. The Eibishter is everywhere. But you're framing the Eibishter. You're putting the Eibishter in the box in front of you and you're locking it on him as he's opposite you. And the whole design of the tefillah reflects that, that mindset. That's the whole the choreography, the, the dance, the, the minhagim of tefillah are about personalizing the Eibishter with yourself, with the mispalel in mokim, in a space. That's the concept. And it appears that in those days when people daven, they davened out loud. If I were talking to you, I wouldn't whisper. And if I weren't talking to you, I wouldn't repeat myself. If I weren't talking to you, I would think before I speak. If I, if, if, if I, were, if I were talking to you, I keep saying weren't, I mean if I were. If I were talking to you, I'd plan every word. If I want something from you, especially something important that only you can give me, nobody else can, I'd measure my words very precisely so that I would impress upon you in a reasonable way that you should give it to me for a reasonable reason, so to speak. So when Chana Davins, everything about her prayer is unreasonable. She's whispering. She's being mafzi. She's repeating herself. She's nudging. She's not just... In other words, in contrast to what apparently was the normal custom of prepare what you're going to say, say it once and get out. He heard you the first time, you know. You know the old expression where a guy comes into a shul and there's a, someone standing in the autumn cave screaming and shouting and crying. 
So uh, he says to the person when they finished up, did you try speaking to him nicely? <laughs> Hast you proved me good? What are you screaming at him for? That you are And Khan is not doing any of that. So the Pasuk says, Eli approaches her, and according to the Cheshbon, that was the very day Eli became the Shefet, it was he, he took his job as the Shefet of the King Godel on that day. Eli approaches her, and Eli says to her, How long are you going to be drunk? He assumes, as a matter of fact, that she's shikin, she's drunk. Now, in chat, in Pshat Shamikin, in simple, simple chat of the Pasuk, why would you think that she's shikin? The Beis Hamikdash was a place it's going to sound wrong but it's, it's, it's not wrong but it's, not, it's also true people were frequently drunk because they ate meat and drank wine that's what they did it was a zevach it was a feast I'm sorry it was not uncommon for people to drink wine at a feast so he says to her you just had a zevach mishpacha your whole family came to Shiloh you're celebrating the brachas the Abishah gave you, the bounty the Abishah gave you, the wealth the Abishah gave you, the health the Abishah gave you, the children the Abishah gave you, the shalom bayis the Abishah gave you. So you ate and you drank to celebrate. So you're coming into the base of Mikdash after a big meal like that, not to say a few, drinking a few cups of wine. They didn't have grape juice or soda. They drank wine if they drank. So he tells her, How long are you going to be shikir? Go out, sober up. You want to talk to the Abishah? Be normal, talk normal, because you want your normal. You, 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 we cannot relate to the Abish as the Abish to this. We don't even know what he is. So we relate to the Abish as a person. Just like I would talk to you, there would be a certain understanding of reason and normalcy and order. When you talk to the Abish, you do the same thing. Not because the Abish deserves that, because that's the best we could give him. I wouldn't talk to anybody the way Chana talked to the Abish. It's not reasonable, it's not constructive, it's not helpful. So she responds, Lo yadoini, yayin v'sheich aleisha sisi, I'm not shikir, and I didn't drink any wine. And she says, Ishok shasru achanechi, I'm bitter, I'm very, very bitter. Vo'esh pechas nafshi lifni avayi, I'm pouring out my soul before God, which is called, Hishtap chasanefesh, I'm pouring out my kishkes. So Eli immediately responds, L'chi l'shalem, go in peace. V'likei Yisrael yitin eshelah secha shashalach mi'imei, the God of Israel should give you the request that you're asking of him. And of course, the Rem is that people like to say, Sheilasech means the request, but Sheilasech means the loan. The loan that you're borrowing from him. Shmuel Anavi is one of those people uh, that Elisa Lamarim Shavisa Shevi. He's one of those Nishamas that should not have been born. You know, we Chana uh, borrowed him from the Abishter and gave him to the Jewish people. Shmuel lived 52 years. Of those 52 years, 50 years he served. Five zero. 50 years he came, she brought him back two years later. Shmuel was a sort of wunder kid. Shmuel was not a normal child. He was like Rivko, got married at three, so Shmuel, she was, he was two years old, she brought him back. She didn't go to the base of Mikdash. The next two years she missed. What happened was she comes out of the base of Mikdash and she's happy. She knows that she's, the, the feel is going to work. And Elkanah sees that she's no longer bitter. She's no longer with a sour face. And she gets pregnant. She was, the Gemara says that. That's why we say it feels Chana. The Kriya Satayda is Vashem Pogadah Sara. That Sara was Nifkadah Barash Hashanah. And Chana was Nifkadah Barash Hashanah. As she stays home with the baby for two years and she dotes on him and she raises him. Then she brings it to Beis HaMikdash and she pushes it and leaves him there. Because she swore that the Abish gives her a child that's called Zera Anosh, the seed of man. In other words, not a regular person, but uh, in, pl in simple English, on the Shama Datsilis, you know, a Rebbe. So he's going to, I'm going to give him to the Abish his whole life. She swore, this is one of the most strange Allahs, she swore that he's going to be a Navi his whole life, a, a, a Nazir his whole life. Shimshan Agib was made a Nazir by the, by the, by the Malach. Okay, I shall make Xerish be a Nazir. And Shimshan Agib was not a normal Nazir, because Shimshan Agib was allowed to drink wine, he just was not allowed to cut his hair. It's called Nazir Shimshan. Shmuel was a Nazir Eilam, who was a regular Nazir. Who was halachically allowed to cut his hair every 12 months. There's this category called Nazir Eilam. Afshalom, that every 12 months they cut the hair and they bring a carbon and then the Nazir continues. But they can't drink wine, come down with a mason. She made her son a Nazir Eilam, not before he was born. Before he was conceived. And that's a, a, a Nazir is a neder, it's not a shvua. It has to be hal on something. It has to have tvisa. You can't make someone to a nazir if that someone's not yet existent. It's, uh, 
she, she wasn't even a Matthias, Bechlal, he wasn't, she wasn't even pregnant. And he was a Nazir, Shmuel, Naziris, whatever the particular halacha would plays out, he kept her neder, whether he was mechoyiv to or not mechoyiv to, on what ground? How can a mother bechlal make her son? How can any person make another person into a nazir? You make yourself into a nazir, a nazir. And she made her son into a nazir. He served 50 years. Most of those years he served as a subordinate to Eli. And when Eli passes away, he was his Eli's successor as the Nasi Yisrael. Eli served 40 years. So the first year was when she was, when she was pregnant, is this. And then the next 39 years, Shmuel was alive. And then after that, officially Shmuel served for 12 years as a Nasi. But he crowned, he anointed Shaul HaMelech and he anointed David HaMelech in that short period of time. Shmuel HaNavi. Shmuel HaNavi, the Gemara says, was Shokel Kameshu Ka'aren. Shmuel HaNavi was as great as Moshe and Aaron combined. Imagine, Shmuel HaNavi was as great as Moshe and Aaron combined. As Ezek the Gemara. So, the Shaila, so wait, she comes back. And she goes over to, to Shoifet, Eli, and she says, Remember I was here and you called me drunk? Well, here he is. Here he is. This is the child for which I davened. And then she leaves him in the base of Mekdash. And whenever they came, they came as a family for Leah Leregel. She brought him new clothing. She brought him some cookies. Shmuel Navi was nitkan namalat kint. He lived in the base of Mekdash at the age of two and a half years old. And he looked after himself. They didn't pamper him, you understand? They didn't have to put him on a lunchbox and buckle him in a seatbelt and send him off to Chayden. He was a, an ex- extraordinary human being. He was one of those Nishamists that, uh, different rules, you know? Like it says about the Baal Shem Tev, at the age of three months, at the age of three months, he could walk and talk. It's scientifically impossible. It's biologically not possible. It can't be. At three months to talk, a, a baby, the brain is even developed at that age. The Baal Shem Tev, Shemtev, at three months, Shmuel was one of those Nishamists, you know? But wait, so, so the Rebbe's Sikha is, Eli thinks she's drunk, and he confronts her. This is the Beis HaMikdash, this is the house of God, and you're drunk. I forgive you your drunkenness, but I don't forgive you being here now. This is not the right time to come here. Sober up, go home. They say in Yiddish, I don't even know such a word. I think that's one of those words that developed over many years of Fabreng Anishin. Sober up, clean up, Come back and talk to the Rebbe Shlach what, what are you hysterical for? So she says, No, Yaim Veshech Aleish Shasisi, I'm not shikir, not even then. Ishak Shasruach Anech, we can find bitter. I'm bitter. For Esh Bechas Nafsh, you live never, I am poor God myself before God. So the Rebbe asks the question. Eli accuses her of being drunk, right? And as everybody knows, you tell a drunk that he's drunk, he says, No, I'm not drunk, I just had a couple of drinks. <laughs> no drunk admits that they're drunk. Ailey calls her shrunk. She says, no, I'm not. And he immediately says, he, 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 he believes her. When she says, I'm not drunk, I'm, I'm hysterical, I'm, I'm in a state of yishtap chasan nefesh, Ailey believes her and gives her a baruch. So the question is, what was Ailey thinking when he accused her of being drunk? And why does Ailey back away the moment Hannah says, I'm not drunk, I'm bitter? And the Rebbe says, and this is, this is, it, it's, I'm sort of, I'm using this Maim as an excuse to share this Sikha with you. This is the Sikha, it's Yud Tes, Rosh Hashanah. It's one of my favorite Sikhas. I've taught it many times. Um, what the Rebbe says is like this. There are two types of tefillahs because there's two types of bakoshas. This is very interesting, okay? There's two types of prayer because there's two types of requests. If a person wants to have a new Buick or a new Cadillac or whatever it is that they're driving today, a Tesla, yeah. A person wants to have a new car. And, and he comes to the Abish and says, Listen, Abish, I, I, I'd like a new car. There are people in this world whose relationship with the Abish is such that asking the Abish for a new car is tefillah and it's iskashrus and it's religion. This is their madrega. A mensch was held by Anaya Khan. You know the story that the Rebbe's, one of the Rebbe's nurses was a goy. And he, he was going, he took a day off to go fishing. And he said to the Chavre that uh, everybody asked the Rebbe for a blessing. Should ask the Rebbe for a with the fishing. He says, sure. So he went to the Rebbe. He came back. Dr. Rosen told him to fish this big. He, says, it was, it was, he went fishing in a place where there were not fish this size. He came and all the Chavre ate his fish. A fish, a fish has no shechit. As long as it's a kosher and a min, it's, it's good. He came back with a fish this miss. Rebbe Dr. Rosen described the fish. It was, he says, there's no fish like this in that lake. 
He got a bracha for them for a fish, you know. There's a person who came down for a bracha for his dog. And he got a bracha, and the dog was mad at him. I mean, you have stories like that. I mean, it's not uh, the highest, it's not the uh, Binyamin Kletzke, or Meshavalenke, or Rabbi Zalman Zezmet. Every person on his level. If a person needs for the Ebishter a Cadillac, he asks for it, and the Ebishter gives him. Here's the deal. How much can you want it? How much can you want it? And basically, basically is a big bad word, but I'm going to use it. Basically, there's two sources of want. There's two sources of want. In other words, when a person desires something, he wants it because. You can give two answers to that question. Answer number one, his brain tells him he wants it. It's a logical, it's an intellectual need. It's a reasonable need. Now, the brain doesn't desire. The brain simply explains what you need. Right? The brain does the ordering, right? The heart gets online and sits nervous and shifting and hopes that that's going to run out of supply until you get to the counter. The brain says, this is a good thing, so you want it. You have to assume a person wants a Buick or a Cadillac or whatever it is, season tickets to some sports uh, venue. It's very, very important to him. But the source of that importance comes from, from his outer heart, from his mind. It's not coming from your Yechida. Yechida doesn't need t- season tickets to a football game. It's just not, it's just, it's not that important. It can't be that important. So when you want something, that the root of that want is from your mind, since the beginning of the desire is reasonable, the quality of the request has to be reasonable. And that's what Eli says to her. You come into Abish, you're asking for something, ask like a mensch. Sakana answers, no, you don't understand. If I wanted a Buick, <laughs> if I wanted a Cadillac, I would do what you're saying. I would talk like a mensch. Why? Because the source of this desire is a reasonable desire. The source of this want is a logical want. Since the source of this want is a logical want, I make the request in a logical way. But then there's another kind of want, where the want is not coming from the mind, where the want is coming from the soul. There are certain things that matter to a person all the way to his very, very core. Right? The simplest example I could give you, right? What's the best example of somebody that you need in your Yechid Shab and Nefesh? The answer is to live. I want to live. People are sick. And they can't have them. Right? The Alter Rebbe was, was so excited against himself in Tafresh Tafko from the Bays. And he said, I want to live. I need 20 more years to spread Chasidis. I'm not afraid of being nostalgic. I want to live. That desire didn't come from his mind. That desire came from his very essence. And the Veda Leia, his daughter, gave her life. The Alter Rebbe, the mother, that the Alter Rebbe should live 20 more years. As we all know the story. Sometimes a want comes from your very soul. Now, listen. One of the things that touches people very deeply, and perhaps not one of the things, the thing that touches the person very deeply, and I want you to know, for those to whom it comes easy, they don't even begin to understand it, is to have children. <coughs> Bechlau people, especially women. Rivka, Rachel says to Yankov Avinu, If I have no children, I'm dead. I had a story with me. That happened to me. And I'm going to share it with you. I have a mother who's such a sweetheart. She cannot kill. She kills a cockroach. She, 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 she says Kaddish. I mean, she's, she, she's a very gentle lady. She's a very gentle lady. Extraordinarily gentle. Um, and I was, my father raised me. My mother loved me, my father raised me. My mother loved me a lot. But there are certain lessons I learned from my mother that she doesn't even know she gave them to me, but they're real lessons. One of the lessons is we knew a couple that was childless. We knew a couple that was childless. Then they, after years, they had children, and as soon as they had children, they got divorced. I was your age. I was around your age. And you know, you're figuring everything out. So I said to my mother, and I guess you could say I was testing, I was afraid to tell it to my father. Um, you see, it was better that they didn't have kids. You see, it was better they didn't have kids. They had kids and they got divorced. And my mother's reaction was visceral. I forgot the first words, but the last words were, a woman who doesn't have children is dead. Like, don't even say that. She, she didn't see it my way at all. I think I was testing the waters. I wanted to see how she would react, but she gave me such a strong reaction. A woman who doesn't have children is dead. Like, don't, how could you say such words? 
and it's got into my head and my heart. I've repeated the story many times. It's, it's a lesson I learned from my mother. I, I, you know, my mama, my precise let it. A real, as a teenage boy who doesn't know what family is, doesn't know what children is, and perhaps is a little bit afraid of all those things, it was, a, it was good for me to hear. It was very important for me to hear. So Chana is davening for children. But that's not yet the end of the story, says the Nebuchadnezzar. Mm-hmm. That's not yet the end of the story. What's the end of the story? Now here comes the key point. Chana's neshav, Chana knew. Chana was a Nevi'ah. The Gemara says this, 85 prophets, 48 prophets and 7 prophetesses whose words are written for posterity. The Gemara says, the number of Nevi'ah that we had, the Tukur Sanvua, is 1.2 million. 1.2 million, 1 million 20,000 Nevi'ah, which means if it's a thousand years, according to my figure, it's exactly a thousand years, it's 12,000 new Nevi'ah per year. Every year there were 12,000 new Nevi'ah, which means every month a thousand new Yid became Nevi'ah. That's almost as many smichas that people go out in the Chodesh. Nevoah was then like today's smicha. A lot of people would have him, but it was serious, it was real. Nevoah means you can't get to the Abishan. Chana was not Stama Nevoah. Chana is a Nevoah whose words are recorded in Tanakh. Of all the 1.2 million, the record that we have is only of 55. Because Nevoah shall nitzach al deiris nichtavsa, and Nevoah shall nitzach al deiris nichtavsa. In other words, the prophecies that were necessary for generations was written down. Prophecies were not necessary for generations. That even though we say call the Nevi'ah b'tel when Mashiach comes, the Nevi'ah becomes redundant because all Yidden of Adreges Navi, Chana was a prophetess, and Chana knew that the reason her neshama came into this world was to produce a child that's shakul kamei Adam. She knew that was her purpose. Her neshama came into this world to, to mother a yingela, a boy who is going to be as great as Mesh and Adam together, who's going to crown. Shaul HaMelech and he's going to crown David HaMelech and begin Malchus based David. Based on David HaMelech is so high of a guy. So there's a third Madrege. She wasn't asking for something which came from her mind. She was asking something that came from her soul. She wasn't asking for something that came from her soul. She was asking for something which was the very purpose of her soul. So if you wanted to put this three into a line, the first type of prayer would be called Nefesh Ruach Neshama. The middle kind of prayer would be called Chaya. The third kind, this is Mamet Shechida. If you would go to Chana's very essence, what would you see? Shmuel Anavi. And she comes to the Abish and says, I want to fulfill my shlichas. Now you must understand, Chana had other kids. Chana had what they called normal children who played in the sandbox and pulled each other's hair and they got scratched. And they went to school, and they had to have PTA. V'choli, v'choli, v'choli. Shmuel was the oldest. Chan had five children. But this child, it was it, first of all, the etzem inyan. Children touch a person in a very deep place. And Vashen is this is the purpose of Chan as the So it comes that Rebbe says like this: When I'm asking for something, that the source of that need is a, is a reasonable need, I can only ask for it reasonably. And that's Ailey's presumption. Ailey sees a woman who's just spent time with her family feasting. He was not aware of the fact that she fasted. She refused to eat. The whole family was eating and drinking. And that was the Seder, like by us Yom Tif. They ate meat and they drank wine and they celebrated they, through the food and drink. Through that through the, through the food and drink, they celebrated the brachas that the Abishta gave him. Chana was a member of this household. She did not participate in it, but Eli didn't know it. Then after the whole feast, she walks into the base of Mikdash. She's being mafta b'tfilah, she's davening hysterically. So Eli says to her, This is not how you talk. You wouldn't talk this way to your husband or talk to it to the Abishta. So she says, this is not reason. If it was reason, I would talk reasonably. This is super reason. And it's not only super reason because I need it on a level which is beyond seichel. I need this on the level of tachlis, iridas, nishmas, ilamata. My soul came into this world to mother Shmuel Anav. You know the story? The Rebbe was giving dollars. And a, a woman walked up to the Rebbe and said, Rebbe, I would like to have children like you. And without that missing a beat, the Rebbe said, so then be a mother like my mother. Now, the Rebbe's mother's name happened to also be Chana. And there's no two felik, there's no uh, mistakes in these kinds of things. But I don't think Nishamas like the Rebbe come along just because you have a mother like Chana. Nishamas like this come along because Chana was mandated to bring such a Nishamah into the world. So now Chana says to Eli, 
when you daven for something that the source of that bakasha is on a level which is completely beyond seichel, the tziur of the tefillah is beyond seichel. When you daven for something reasonably, you daven in a reasonable form. When you daven for something which is super reasonable, you daven in a super reasonable form. When you daven on a level of something which touches your essence, your essence comes out. It's called the shtap chasa nefesh. And this, this is what Chana says to Eli that makes Eli stop. Eli, accused of being drunk, says the Rebbe, Eli never meant that Chana was inebriated. That's how the Rebbe explains it. Eli never thought Chana was drunk. He never thought that. He thought she was drunk in prayer. It's like a person who becomes hysterical about a Cadillac. And it could happen. Oh, could it happen? People get hysterical about their ball team losing a game. Mom is hysterical. But Emma is hysterical. And they could daven to the Hamish to the It's hysterical to watch. It's to watch sports fat. It's mamish funny. It's like life and death. It's a bura. It's a ball game. It's a it's a competition. It's take real. The competition is real, but it's a ball game. It's not a war. No one's dying. Obviously, negia as I did. Yeah. says to her, "You are overreacting." You're not acting, you're asking for something reasonable, super reasonable way. And she says, no, this request comes from a place in me which is beyond reason. And it justifies a prayer which can't be explained reasonably. This is the source of my hysteria. And then it actually is correct. That's, that is actually correct. That's, so of course, what the Rebbe does in that tzich, in Chayel Kitas, says, the Rebbe says, why do we say the story of Chana's Tfil Rosh Hashanah? So you look at the Gemara. You say the story of Chana Hashanah because the Rosh Hashanah lived the Chana because that's when Chana conceived. Chana became pregnant on Rosh Hashanah. But the Rebbe says that's the whole reason. That's it. Just because Chana conceived the Shana, the whole of Torah. And by the way, it's a long of Torah. You read both Nevias. You read her prayer. You read her tefillah asking Hashem for a child, which is a short, very bitter tefillah. And then you read the second tefillah. She comes back two years later. She deposits Shmuel the Beis Hamikdash. She goes into the Beis Hamikdash and she says a beautiful tefillah. A beautiful tefillah, huh? huh? <coughs> it's Rosh Hashanah. We say it's Rosh Hashanah. All the snafshe Hashem. It's beautiful. <laughs> you know the words that we say in Kave, Ki mi elakag. It's very kolkenu. Those words are part of the second tefillah. She comes back again. Hashem yechetu b'li. I don't remember the tefillah by heart. But it's a beautiful tefillah. And the whole thing you read Rosh Hashanah. Then he says, that we read Rosh Hashanah just because Shmuel was conceived in Rosh Hashanah. So then he says, no. We read that Rosh Hashanah because Rosh Hashanah's tefillah is like her tefillah. On Rosh Hashanah, every Jew is on a Yechidah level. And his relationship with the Eibishter is a Yechidah relationship. And his prayer is a, Rosh, is a, is a Yechidah prayer. Meaning, Rosh Hashanah, you dive in differently than a whole year. Why? All year long, you talk to Eibishter reasonably. Because screaming at him is, is, is not correct. If you have a, re a reasonable re request of God, ask of it in a reasonable way. There's a time of year, emphasis on the word time, where the whole conditioning, like I told you in my first introduction, about Yud Gimami de Sarachamim. When you dive with him, Yud Gimami de Sarachamim. The 10 days of Tshuva, one Yid shows up in Davin, says Yud Gimami Sarachamim, because it's a time of Yechidah. So the Rebbe says, we read Nevoah's Chana and Rosh Hashanah not because Shmuel was conceived. We read Nevoah's Chana Hashanah because our prayer mirrors hers. You can't dive in that way the day before Rosh Hashanah. You can't dive in the way the day after Yom Kippur. If you scream at the Abish, you become hysterical, it doesn't become Yechidah Sheba Nefesh. It becomes Meshuggah. But Rosh Hashanah, we're all holding by Yechidah. So the parallel between Nevoah's Tfilah's Chana and Rosh Hashanah is the, it's, 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 it's earmarking, it's framing the whole day. On this day, I give you the Gibbon Midas and Achman. Smele Tachas Tereshi, the Gvura Shalmaile. And this Gibbon Midas puts us in a position that all of us are talking to him on the deepest level, and I have to say, because we're asking for the deepest things. Rosh Hashanah, you're not for a Cadillac. Because a Cadillac. There's no Cadillac in Yechida. The top. Last time I checked. There's Tehre Mitzvahs. There's Mashiach. There's Gil Elokus. There's Avedis Hashem. There's winning the Yitzhahara. There's being Besimcha. That's in Yechida Shem and Efe. That's the connection. So this is my second introduction. 
The first introduction I gave you was about having a minion. My second introduction is about Tfilas Chana. I'm using these two Bishalav as illustrations for Tfilah Arichta. They're not perfect Bishalav, they're not. The point I'm trying to bring out is that davening is a din, and davening has alochas. And then there's a madreg of davening which is much higher. It comes from the deepest place. It's coming from the Yechidish Abin Efesh. Now, in my first introduction, it had to do with a minion. In my second introduction, it has to do with the nature of your need, right? The Rebbe is speaking about every single tefillah. We don't say Hashem's Fasai Tiftah Rafiq Til Sech We say it three times a day. And then Shabbos we say it four times a day. And in Kippur we say it five. Every single tefillah begins Hashem's Fasai Tiftah. Because each time we daven, it's Arikta. Each time we daven, it's long. What does long mean? That when we get to Shmanesre, we're involving ourselves with the Eibishter, not reasonably. We're involving ourselves with the Eibish at a level which is higher than reason. And because we're involving ourselves with the Eibish at a level which is higher than reason, we say to him, give me words, I don't have any. So you see, we talked about two examples. Example number one, in the way I figure it, is Yudimu Midas Arachamim. That was the minion example. Example number two is Tfilas Chano, which means she's asking for something which is a Yechida need, such so asks for it in a Yechida way. And I'm saying these two examples are how Hasidus explains each Tshachris, Mincha, Mairev, and a Pasha the weekday. Because we add those six words. Those six words mean what? I put myself in a place where my connection to the Eibishter isn't reasonable. And because my connection to Eibishter isn't reasonable, I say to him, Give me words, I don't have my own. And going back to the beginning of this, that's what the Rebbe Rashab writes. In MSL Tfilah. Everybody says in MSL Torah. This is the Chazal. There's sometimes a Tfilah where the Tfilah is MS. What's the Pshat in Davening? I mean, you know the Gemara. Tfilah, Torah is called Chaya Yailam. Torah is called eternal life. Eternal life has many connotations, and one of them is that it's higher than time. Torah is above time. Tfilah is called Chaya Shah. Chai Shom is bringing Hashem into the moment. What is Emes? Emes never changes. So Emes and Tefillah don't go together. Emes and Taita go together. Taita is above time. It's Emes. But Tefillah is bringing the Abish into the moment. That's not Emes. But Mad Varim Amurim, when you're doing a regular Tefillah. But if you're davening, and the base of your davening is what's called Tefillah Richter, meaning the base of your davening is you're connecting to Hashem on a level which is higher than the mind, Vaharaya, you can't even speak, then the emes of that field is not what you're saying, the emes in that field is that you're connected to the Ebishter. You got it? The, usually we say ain't emes, emes means it never changes, Tayyid never changes. Tefillah is every day different. But if the person's Tefillah begins with his connection to the Ebishter and the level of Yechida, and the proof is he has to ask Hashem to give him words in order to pray because he doesn't have his own. Then the tefillah is also emes. It never changes. Not the request, but the connection. <laughs> and mean it. Mitanemes. We'll continue tomorrow, Mitzvah